Well, I have to put the record straight from the beginning. I really don't amount to all that much. But I do have a great Savior, and that's what brings us together. And what a privilege it is to join in your fellowship and in your prayers. And we're going to be thinking together about our Lord's last command to the church. We call it the Great Commission. There's a lot of confusion as to how this relates to our lives. It reminds me of a young fellow on the college campus going around wearing a big lapel button that had printed on it only the letters B-A-I-K. Someone asked him what that meant. He said, that means, boy, am I confused. And he was reminded, don't you know you don't spell confused with a K? He said, man, you don't know how confused I am. <laughs> well, I think the boy is not the only one in that predicament. You'll find confusion within the house of God. And one place where it becomes evident in trying to relate our life in obedience to our Lord's last command. You'll find it recorded in some way in all the Gospels, but Matthew gives more detail than the others. In the closing verses of chapter 28, where after affirming that he has all authority in heaven and earth, therefore, he tells his disciples what to do. Now, when you see therefore in the Bible, know what it's there for. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And we'll conclude tomorrow with that promise. But our primary attention in these sessions will center on the command itself. And you'll notice there are four action words. Only one of them, though, is a verb. Literally, make disciples. And the objective, of course, is to reach all the world, all nations. Go, baptizing, teaching, or participles. And the same is true in the Greek as is the case in English. Participles are not intended to stand alone. Now, you haven't always observed that fundamental rule of grammar. And that's why you got those red marks on your term paper. No one what to do with that dangling participle. You find the verb, and it always establishes the direction of the participle. Now, when this is recognized, it simplifies this last command of Jesus, which is make disciples. And those disciples, in turn, will some way through their life and their witness and influence be instrumental in fulfilling my mission into the world. But in that objective, keep your priorities clear. He doesn't ask us to make converts. Isn't that interesting? Now, he has already told us you must be converted to enter the kingdom of heaven. That means in true repentance, you turn from sin, and by simple faith, you trust yourself to Jesus Christ and receive the gift of salvation. That is the beginning of a journey. And by that virtue, you begin to learn of Christ, which is the basic meaning of the word disciple, meaning pupil or learner, as in the sense of a follower of the teacher. This is finally then our responsibility. To that end, we go not just to see how busy we can be, but with the purpose of making disciples. And we baptize, confirming, indicating that a person has now identified with Christ. Certainly, that is part of the process of discipling. And to that end, we are to teach. 
but with the objective of teaching learners to follow Christ, to obey all that He has commanded. But by making disciples, we assure ultimately the completion of our Lord's mission into the world. For disciples will continue to learn of Christ, they will grow in His likeness, and in the process they'll become involved in what He has taught them to do. And they'll begin to make disciples and teach others to do the same. So that through the process of multiplication, someday the whole world will have opportunity to hear the gospel. That's the plan. And I do not know of any other way by which the world will finally be reached. Now I have to confess my understanding is very limited. And I will fall far short of my desire to fulfill the mission of Christ. But I believe that I have in Jesus a perfect teacher. He never made a mistake. So wherever we are, we can be certain that in Jesus Christ we have one who knows the way, who is himself the way. And as he affirms in the very beginning of the command, he has all authority, all power in heaven and earth. I recognize though we live in a different culture, in a different age. About 2,000 years have passed since that time he actually walked on the earth. And so some things are going to be different now. Likely even if Jesus was here, he might do some things a bit differently. I came here by car today. Most of you probably did the same thing. If Jesus had come to this meeting, I expect though he would have walked or ridden a donkey. But the method of transportation, you see, is dependent entirely upon the circumstances. The methods are going to change continually as our culture changes, as our times change. But principles are going to be the same in any age and any culture. And I propose to share with you basically nine principles which I believe are reflected in the mission of Christ. And we will begin where we first meet Jesus in the incarnation when Jesus became a servant. Now those of you who have read the master plan recognize this is not one of the eight principles in the book. I'm going to present nine tonight because that whole book is built on this principle of incarnation. I thought it was so obvious I wouldn't have to mention it, but every page of that book depends upon the reality that the Son of God, who had all power in heaven and earth, chose to come into the world and identify with us and bear our sorrows and carry our griefs and finally accept our judgment for our sin on the cross of Calvary. In fact, as you'll note in this next slide, the cross, having already been accepted in advance, made each step that Christ took on earth a conscious acceptance of God's eternal purpose for His life. The cross, you see, was determined in the heartbeat of God from the very beginning of time, as the Bible tells us, He was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God's love was so great, of course, that He wanted to redeem that which He had made. And in the fullness of time, as He had planned from the beginning, He came into the world to effect that redemption. And that was what guided him all through his life. And that's where we begin our journey. When we receive Christ as Savior, we come to the cross and recognize he died for me. For me, who was responsible 
for his death. And it's the awareness of that love so overwhelming. It obliterates any reason for me to want to live to myself because all I am and all I hope to be, I owe to him who bore my sins, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's where we begin the journey. And as we begin that journey, we will begin to find how it works itself out in our daily life, just as it did with Jesus when he came into the world. And having been raised in a rather obscure home, at about the age of 30, he launched out into his public ministry, having fulfilled now the obligation of the eldest son. He left home and he began to minister to the heart Greek of people, just like us. He healed the sick, he opened the eyes of the blind, he cast out those demons that possessed people. He was continually teaching the Word of God and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. It's no wonder that people were attracted to him. Sometimes the numbers were into the thousands. One time we're told 4,000. Another time 5,000 men. If they had counted the women and the children, I expect there were probably 15, 20, or 30,000 on the hillside as Jesus taught the people. But as he looked out upon them, as we have recorded one day in that ninth chapter of Matthew, he saw the people were harassed and scattered like sheep that had lost their way and they had no shepherd to lead them. This was the heartbreak of his ministry, not lack of opportunity, not even acceptance by many people on a popular level, but the fact that the people didn't have anyone who could lead them on in the way of the Lord. He had doing all he could, but he accepted a limitation when he assumed our identity in our very body. And so he called the problem to the attention of the disciples. He said, look out at the harvest, look at this multitude, recognize the problem. Oh, they had those who were supposed to give leaders leadership. They had the scribes and the Pharisees. They had those who had privileged positions in the priesthood. The tragedy was these persons themselves were lost. And you have the irony of the blind leading the blind. He called them hirelings. They were in it for what they could get out of it. But when the sheep were under attack, they would run away and leave them to the prey of wolves. This was the situation as Jesus looked out upon the multitudes. And so he told the disciples, to realize the problem, get under the burden and pray to the Lord of the Great Commission, the Lord of the harvest. Every time you pray, you think of his purpose in coming into the world. And you think of the day that he wants to gather the nations to himself. And so you pray for the solution to the problem that God, who has all power, would send forth workers into his harvest. And the way those words come together, the workers have the characteristic of a shepherd, someone who loves the sheep, someone, if necessary, will lay his life down for them. Multiply those kind of people, and someday you will win the world. And here is where all of us can enter into the ministry. For when he saved us, he made us kings and priests, the Bible says, to serve him. And here becomes the initial and the most basic expression of our faith that we truly follow Christ. And you can look around and see those people that are needing help where you live. Minister to them. Let them know that you love them. Care for them where they hurt. And indeed, 
you'll always have some that will give appreciation. But it's our responsibility to meet them. A shepherd goes after lost sheep. But as you do this, you must recognize always your limitations, which brings us to that next principle I call selection. 